The scripture reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. <clears throat> do, not, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, uh, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, uh, nor revilers, uh, nor uh, extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were uh, sanctified, but you were purchased, you were justified uh, in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Several months ago, about six or seven months ago, I preached the first sermon of what I want to look at several as our political season is heating up. If you don't think it is, read, read something once in a while. <laughs> but there are things we have to deal with as Christians that political um, venues will always push against morality. That is, they will say that something that is immoral is moral. For example, we looked at uh, abortion, and I showed you several quotes of what's going on within the political world, within the media world, but within the world in general, and they say it's okay, that they're not really anything but a lump of cells, that they're just something that's there. Until they come to, out of the womb, they're not really human, and there are laws being pushed, folks. If you haven't kept up, then now they think they can do that even after they're born. And here's a baby over here. Aren't you glad they're here? the babies? I'm too. I'm waiting on them to tune up in just a moment. I like it. It's sometimes the only amen I get from the babies. But what I want to look at something different today, and that is the homosexual agenda. And I call it that because that's exactly what it is. We'll look at some things and have a lot of quotes today, mostly because I want to show you what is going on as we speak, and it seems to get even stronger every day. I, we talked about two or three weeks ago about Christian persecution, and I didn't deal with the fact of beheadings and that sort of thing very much because persecution doesn't always mean death or beatings. And we as the Lord's church are being persecuted left and right, people trying to silence us, trying to put us quite literally out of business. And the Lord's church doesn't go out of business, never has. Last time I read Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, Jesus said when he was going to establish his church, he said the gates of that Hadean realm, Hades, shall not prevail against it. In other words, nothing's ever going to stop my body. Nothing's ever going to stop my church. We're going to grow, we're going to fight, and we're going to continue until the world is no more. Now, folks, that's the body of which we are members. That is the church. That is who we are, and we don't give up fighting. Matter of fact, what I'm talking about today, especially going on the internet and what and so forth, could cause a lot of trouble. Don't get nervous, because the church has insurance, and I know how to pack a moving truck. I've been there. But folks, we laugh about it, and we should, but we can't be scared of secular interest trying to run that which is sacred. And that has happened, and it still happens. God's people aren't putting up the fight. They should and say, well, we better give in because they might sue us. Let them sue. Do we really think the Lord's going to let us go into oblivion when we forget to have our backbone and forget our spine and somehow stand up or don't stand up to evil in all its various forms? Folks, look, we better be the strongest people on earth. We better have that strength and that endurance to withstand whatever onslaught is going to come. I want to start with this. Because this is something we're seeing a lot of today and been around for a while. This is a presidential candidate, by the way. He was in Denver last night. I'll tell you about that in just a moment. That's the thing that I wish the Mike Pence's, Vice President Mike Pence, of the world would understand that if you have a problem with who I am, now that's my uh, quote of what he is, or what he's saying, a gay married man, your problem's not with me, your quarrel, sir, is with my creator. I beg to differ. Unlike this guy, I've actually read the Bible. 
I've actually seen what the Bible teaches about it. Now, here's the thing. We're often told by folks, well, you can't use the Bible to justify it because it's not a real book. We need certain other kinds of logic and reasoning and other facts put in there. But then when push comes to serve, look what he does. Same man recently used the Bible to justify abortion all the way up to nine months. The guy that was interviewing him said, look, if men that are against abortion, men that are against abortion have never gotten the wrong woman pregnant. And the guy said, yeah. He said, if somebody besides your wife. So that justifies it now? Come on, people. This is a hint of what we're seeing in the world. Human life has been denigrated to nothing. And don't think it's going to stop just at abortion. It's going to go on and on and on and on, as most things do. But here's the agenda. Here's things that are going on. Now, I disagree with him for at least two reasons I have on the board for us now. At least two. There are a whole lot more. We'll get to some of those this morning. One reason is I've read Matthew 19. I've also read Genesis chapter 2. From where the quote is taken, Jesus there talking about the, 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 leaders, the Jewish leaders come to Jesus and they want to talk to him about marriage and about right, and Moses and the writing of divorcement. But notice, please, what Jesus does. He doesn't go to the current schools of thought and Judaism in that day. He doesn't go to some other religion. He doesn't rely on what somebody's saying around and politicians or anyone else. But he goes back to the very beginning. Back to the beginning. In the beginning, God created them. Now listen to what he says here. Male and female. Just as they're supposed to be and just as they always will be. God created them. He made them. We understand from the text back in Genesis, in His own image. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27. God made the human race in His own image. We have a soul or a spirit, in other words. And He's done those things. He made them a male and female. And He said the, the man shall leave his mother and father. And He says, be joined to his wife. Please notice how definite God is when He speaks. God has never spoken in vagaries. God has never spoken in terminology that, that would be accepted by the political scene or the cultural scene or anyone else. He simply tells what we need to hear. Man and woman, and they are joined for life. That's the way God set it up. Now, if we want to go back to the problem with our Creator, I'd have to ask Him, who is your Creator? Because that's not mine. My Creator doesn't do those things. The same man last night on stage in Denver, Colorado. You know where that is? Celebrated a nine-year-old boy because he came out and says, I want to be gay too. And it was celebrated on stage. Let me tell you something about nine-year-old minds. You know what they know? A whole lot of nothing. That brain is still developing. It's still mush inside there. They've got probably 15 years before that mind really settles in on who they really are. And we've got people up there running to lead this country that says, no, I want to encourage you in this, and I'm going to stand behind you. His word's not mine. Now, folks, we are in a battle. I hope I'm scaring you just a little bit. hope your blood pressure's rising just a little bit. I would say I've got some pills, but I'm out. We'll try to calm down as we go along. But we need to look at the situation as God has put it there. I also have it open to Proverbs 16 and verse 18 because pride still goes before destruction and a haughty spirit still goes before a fall. Folks, when I start thinking I'm smarter than, as he says, and rightly so, the creator of life, of the world, and all that is and all that ever will be, I have a quarrel with God. Hosea chapter 4, when he begins that chapter, he's talking to the people there of Israel, of the northern kingdom, and he says, the God of Israel has a controversy with the people of the land. Now, folks, you think about that for a moment, and how God has at one time, and still can, have a controversy with the people, because they're not doing what he says. So it doesn't matter what our politicians, what anyone else says, because the real issue we're looking at is in two categories here. There is an aggressive push, and I have three things that stand out. I think you could put most everything under them. There's an aggressive push to accept 
the homosexual lifestyle, gay lifestyle, whatever you want to call it, LGBTQ+, plus is what it normally says. <clears throat> and when you look at this and look at the things that are written, I remember several years ago when this was still a hot-button topic, all they said is we just want to be accepted and not ashamed, and that's all we really want, just to be accepted as who we are. We're not going to push any agendas. We're not going to do anything else. I remember that clearly. But now it's believe it or else. We'll get you fired. We'll have you uh, disbarred from wherever you want to go. We're going to change things. Remember what they told us for years, not just people like this, but liberal folks told us for years, well, as Christians, you can't legislate morality. You know what they're doing now? Legislating morality. It's already happened right here, folks. It slipped right in and we missed it. California, Indiana, Illinois, you name it. States are changing their views on morality in general, left and right, because of an aggressive push for things. Push to accept them, push to legalize and politicize. I've already talked about that, but I think number three might be the scariest, to simply do away with the Christian ethic and morals to say that you're wrong and believe it or not they have switched things around they're actually using a moral argument now not just within homosexual communities and agenda but in other areas that are immoral too they say well it's not it's not moral to denounce somebody for being different than you I agree but it is immoral or it is moral to denounce someone who's being different than what God says it is very moral and even outside, uh, I could argue this same principles as someone without ever cracking the Bible. That's the thing about it, because it even goes against nature, as the Bible also teaches as well. But think about the bully pulpits that are out there. Hollywood has a mighty big one, but it is shrinking, according to some reports. Amen. It's starting to shrink a little bit. They don't have quite the sway as they used to have, because people are saying, wait a minute. You're telling me I need to ride a bicycle 10 miles to work and you take a private jet every week somewhere. And they say, wait a minute. You're telling me I need to be more moral and take care of certain things and then you go out and do all kinds of immorality and get your picture in the newspaper and make an extra million bucks for it. Wait a minute. You tell me that it's wrong to carry a gun, but your last, three weapon, your last three movies have been about killing 30 people at a time. Yes. Hypocrisy speaks for itself, doesn't it? But it is a bully and has been a bully pulpit. Because after all, they're actors. They know everything. At least they know how to pretend they know everything, right? But they do that. Politics, I've already mentioned some of that. Strongly in favor, as, the whole, as a lot of people we've seen. And most of it is through number three there, the media. Most of the mass media is going to produce a narrative that is going to be very accommodating to not just this agenda, but in the agenda, mostly as long as it is against any kind of Christian right. We don't want it. Or as people often say, the Judeo-Christian ethic. If there's anything against that, anything against any kind of conservatism, we don't want it. And I'm sure you've met people that if they wonder what it is, if it's wrong, I want to do it. <laughs> I don't know why. If it's wrong, I want to do it. I want to be caught up in that. I want to be a part of that. I want to go out and cheer and protest and all the things I can do. Because of that, we talked about a moment ago, I want to end with it too, of a forced acceptance. You're either going to accept and do what I say, or I'm going to label you. And I'll talk about our labels in another sermon. Racist, bigot, homophobic, misogynistic. Man, they throw those words around all the time. Somebody's been studying a thesaurus, haven't they? All these words thrown around, and they've completely lost their meaning. Because it doesn't mean anything, and you can call me sticks and stones all you want to but it still doesn't change the fact of what is right when we redefine sexuality according to our own desire we open the door to allow anything to be considered acceptable for example infidelity that's already been accepted has it not so what but you know what let me scare you a little bit let me scare you a whole lot number two is being pushed in this very hour by folks in certain positions within this country. 
I would call them Americans, but I don't think that's American. It is coming to that point. I have seen quotes that will turn your stomach, and I'm not going to quote them, but of what they say, and they, they want to justify it on the same grounds that homosexuality is, is justified, that abortion is justified, or anything else. They have created their own ethical code. Ethics is the teaching about morality, and morality is what you do according to ethics, okay? There's a difference between the two. But they've created their own ethical code, and now that ethical code is what we have to go by. Well, how do we know it's true? Because so-and-so said it. Well, how do we know he's true? Because so-and-so said it. And it comes right down the line, and welcome back to third grade. We're going to believe anything that's thrown in front of us. Remember the nine-year-old I talked about? Someone has told him that he's gay and should just champion that cause, including the man on stage last night as well. Folks, we're living in a sick world, in a dangerous world, and an ungodly world. We need to look at what God has to say on the matter and the understanding of it. And I put two things up here. And by the way, that's my quote. Feel free to quote me. I don't care. I told you we have insurance, lawyers, and I know how to pack a moving truck. You can quote me all you want to. But how about quoting God for just a moment? Genesis 19 there in Sodom and Gomorrah, one thing that was going on in that situation was when the angels as men came inside uh, of Lot's house, the men of the city, very specific, says, go there, and they say, hey, we want those men that we may know them. In the biblical context, that has an asexual sense. Now, here's the thing. People will say, oh, but see, that was just rape. I have a debate book in my library I've read a couple of times that that's what they'll say. Well, that's just talking about rape, so that's all that's being condemned there is rape. But remember what the last quote was that guy put up there? That once we start accepting one kind of sexual immorality, be careful because a lot of things are being pushed. And again, they're under our radar because they slip them in through uh, various political forums and get them in. But here's the thing about it. When I look at Jude 7... 7th verse of the short book of Jude, he talks about Sodom and Gomorrah, and they were going giving themselves to strange flesh. Giving themselves, that is a willful act, is it not? Willful act of all the things they were doing. So no, it wasn't just condemning rape, it's condemning the idea of homosexuality, same-sex attraction, whatever you want to call it, in and of itself. And folks, understand something, and I hope I speak for everybody. We don't hate the homosexual, the gay, the lesbian, the whatever else, at all. Right? Thank you. Because last time I read, did we not read in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 a moment ago? And right after you had the homosexuals, the sodomites, which were actually uh, prostitutes uh, in the first century setting, sodomites, and he says drunkards. We see the homosexual couple out here, we want to turn our nose. We see the guy over there throwing back a few and getting drunk, and we want to laugh. I think I see an inconsistency too, don't you? Yes. That guy is just as lost, or that woman is just as lost. Or the person that tells the lies, and we want to laugh at those things too. Wait a minute. Sin, I, I was always, always been taught that sin wasn't a laughing matter, no matter what it is. And our thing, what we need to do as Christians then, is to turn and listen and to convert. Wherever we have to start our conversion, to bring people around to where they need to be. Uh, I'll talk about this guy in just a moment. The understanding of sexual orientation as an innate, biologically fixed property of human beings, the idea that people are, now here's a phrase we see a lot, born that way is not supported by scientific evidence. Uh, Dr. Mayer here, uh, it's a long, about 130 page report that I've read a couple of times from the New Atlantis about four years ago. He and another man, he in particular, were asked to, these are psychologists and neuroscientists from Johns Hopkins University. All right, So it's not like they came from Podunk University, because that's what they'll say. Well, they're not from the right university. No, they are. They have taught in this field for years and years and years and years, and they've seen, going back to at least the 1970s on, all of the problems of dealing with... Uh, matters of sexuality. I'll bring them up again when I talk about transgenderism or gender dysphoria as it's called today another time. But here's what's going on. 
He looked at it, and the other guy and others with all the researchers looked at it from a scientific standpoint, and they said, we cannot say I was just born that way. They said, we found nothing anywhere in the research and the blood work and all the neural work we've done and all the things that everybody else's reports have turned in, nothing to say that it is an inborn trait. And I think about Psalm 139 and verse 14, don't you? Because we, God said, the psalmist says there, speaking for God, that we are created how? But in that great, marvelous way, right? That's how God created us. Fearfully and wonderfully made. We're created right. We're created to know, right, know the difference between one thing or another. Now, in case someone says, wait a minute, that guy must have his bias, let's back up two pages and look what he said as well. I strongly support equality and oppose discrimination for the LGBT, this was before the plus was added, community and have testified on their behalf as a statistical expert. Now listen to what this man says. My bias, my, if I have biases, they are, they are granted toward the non-supportive group. You understand what he's saying? So when he says they're not born that way, he's speaking from, I do, notice what he says there. Strongly support equality. Now, equality in that sense is just like it's being crammed down our throats today. That we need to, everybody's treated the same. No one, no matter what your sexual preference, no matter anything else, whatever it is, we're just okay, just leave us alone. And that's what he said. That's what he did. He also testified on behalf of a statistical expert that everything was okay. But he cannot say, and thank the Lord for true scientists, that the science says... Oh, you're just born that way and there's nothing you can do, so everybody should leave you alone. Because haven't we heard that for years? We need to learn what the science has to say. Well, I've been looking at the science for about 15 to 16 years, and it never has said what people want it to say. And the Bible doesn't teach, as we looked at earlier, what people want it to say. So what it comes down to is, I'm going to do what I want to do. And that's what people do. Now, there is a lot of research and I believe uh, the research that I've read from a psychological standpoint, there's a mental illness there because it's not a natural thing to go after someone of the same desire. Uh, same with gender dysphoria, many other things. There's a host of evidence, and let me tell you why. Because there are thousands and thousands and thousands, at least, of confirmed reports that people have one time been gay, lesbian, whatever, and have gone back and left that lifestyle and gone to a heterosexual lifestyle or just none at all. We can make a choice, folks. But you know what happens to those stories? They get buried way, way down. And a, from, and a term that's, that's thrown around a lot today by liberal folks is junk science. The man we're looking at here, I can assure you for over 40 years, nearly 50 years, he and his co-author, I'll bring it up the next time we talk, have been practicing in this area for around 50 years apiece and have been lauded for all those 50 years and rightly so as some of the greatest in psychology and neuroscience in the world, not just America. But see what happens? This man Lentz in his introductory, this is part of the introduction, in his introductory to his book, um, I've read it through a couple of times in my library, but one thing that he documents in there, he says, we couldn't get as many people, experts, to testify as we wanted to that are professors in neuroscience or psychology or medicine or psychiatry from different places because they feared for their jobs. I told you about persecution before, didn't I? And look what's happening. He listed several. He got several to, to testify and to give in, turn in evidence. But he said most fear too much for their jobs and then will be fired from the research department, from teaching faculty, or whatever else it is. They were afraid to speak out. Now folks, when good people are afraid to speak out, we're in trouble. We're in a lot of trouble. So, with those things, think about a couple other things with me here this morning. The genetics we've talked some about, uh, the popular rhetoric goes around. We'll talk about some of those things in just a moment. Superstars, that's our Hollywood, but also athletes. Oh, well, so-and-so said it. I guess it's okay, because that guy can shoot a great three-pointer. He must know a lot about neuroscience and psychology, psychiatry. 
Oh, what, he skips college? Oh, I guess he learned it all in high school then, when he was still just a kid, right? Now, I'm not saying that someone who doesn't have a degree in those things can't learn something about it, but it's almost like they're put up there as a witness uh, that is, uh, you know, that witness that has trained in that sort of area and that sort of thing. But that's not true. Yet, people believe it and they listen to those things. And now, folks, people are ignoring the scientific argument. What I showed you a moment ago, I have files about that thick, several of them in my office, of paperwork within the last three to four years, most of them uh, within the last year, of real science. Real science is observation. It's watching something over time. Not looking at it once and making a, a, an end conclusion of it, but looking at it. And you can go back through folks in Sweden and other places that have been studying this very thing since the early 1970s. And you should see what goes on with folks when they don't listen and don't change and keep living. Not just this lifestyle, but gender dysphoria or whatever else it may be. They live a life of confusion and they get into a lot of crime and a lot of suicide and things. And again, I digress. We'll talk about those later. But we're ignoring it today, and now we're just chunking it out or using the term junk science, right? Because if somebody says it, it's automatically right. People don't know how to ask anymore, can you please prove that? Can I see a document about it? I don't want to see high school kids running out here and telling me about what science is. I want to see the science teacher, the professors, the scientists that work in labs. Can you please tell me and show me evidence? We've got enough gray matter to understand plain evidence, don't we? God has granted us those things to look at and understand it. But now, I said earlier, it's turned into a moral argument. Now, here's their ethical, ethical standard, and the morals come underneath that, and they'll say things like, well, it, under human rights, it's a basic human right to support anybody, even though they're different than we are. Now, look, they're using generic terms, different than we are. They're trying to make the old argument that people have made for years over prejudices over black and white, Hispanic, black, whatever else it is. And I agree with that. We're all human beings. But you know what we can't agree with? That people can practice any lifestyle they want and still be pleasing to God. God still sets the standards. And the only people there, like the first guy, the only people that ever quote God, misquote God. About this, about abortion, about a lot of other things that are disgusting in this world, and the first thing about it, you know what? The first guy I quoted is, claims to be a Christian. Pretty adamantly claims to be a Christian. Married to a man, kill babies, that stuff's okay as long as you love God. You know, last time I read my Bible, when you love God, you do His commandments. That's what John said in 1 John chapter 2. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, that's as simple as it gets. You'll do what I say. You won't make up your own jargon your own things out there as well. This guy, Simon LeVay, I have up here, is a neuroscientist, out, neuroscientist outspoken homosexual advocate uh, and also a homosexual himself. Uh, in 1991 was his first study, and he's done some since then, and that's really what he's talking about here is other studies. This man would go out and he would get cadavers from morgues and that sort of thing of known homosexuals over here and straight, as I like to call us, males over here. And he would cut open their brain and look in there, and he was looking for something different in the brain that made someone gay, homosexual, whatever you want to call it. Guess what he never found? And in recent years, they've still been looking for the gay gene. That's their terminology, not mine. As if somehow in this testing it's going to pop up that this person was meant to be this way, the science says they are, and we just can't help it. But I've shown you the evidence, and there's a lot more evidence than that, but I don't want us to be here all day, about what the science actually says. I've read articles that are supposed to be scientific from folks on the left and the liberal agenda that are scientists, and they never make a scientific argument. They make this long, rhetorical, drawn-out argument from feelings and everything else, and I think, how are you a scientist? when you can't look at evidence that's printed before you, yet they do all the time. You've probably heard these about a million times a piece, like I have, or read it in articles you've looked at. And the inborn thing we've looked at some, and here's what we're going to say. I read this one recently uh, in a Christian publication. 
They, they tried to neither go for or against it, but it didn't work so well. Anyway, some, some people say, I can't change who I am any more than I can change the color of my eyes. Now, the color of our eyes is genetic, right? You remember that from biology class. We get it from our parents. So there's dominant genes, not so dominant genes. But now what they're saying is that it's genetic and someone passed it down. Like you do certain diseases, like you do certain eye color, like you do hair color, like you do whatever else it may be. Pass those things down. If that's true, then their parents or grandparents at least, Uncle Lance, must have been also homosexual too, right? If we're going to look at a genetic uh, 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 and uh, analyze the genetics of this like they do, that's where we have to go. We have to look at it in that sense that it goes down to that, but it simply isn't that way. Born this way, I can't change who I am. Listen, folks, I don't believe any of that, and I'll tell you why. Not only does God teach different about both of those and many other things, in Leviticus chapter 18 and chapter 20, and those chapters and, uh, all the way through there, uh, there are not just this, but sexual um, sins are condemned, from bestiality to homosexuality to lots of other things that are going on, incest, etc. And he goes through this long list of things in there. As much as we don't like to read those things, folks, we need to read those like everything else and understand the clear picture of where God is. And when you read through Leviticus, you see a lot of things. You see, first of all, the, our need for Jesus Christ and His blood, because the animals never could do. But you also see a need for purity among God's people, including sexuality, including um, every manner of life, including many other things, are all in there. And the worst thing we've done, folks, over the years is skip these topics in Bible class. And I'm talking to everybody now. Don't be embarrassed. Talk about what the Bible talks about. Let people understand this is what the Bible says, and this is why it says it. There are dietary restrictions and everything else. God is taking care of His people. Because all the nations around them, you know what they were doing? Promoting all the things that God said is, is, is good, that God says is bad. Just like today. So those things make a great application to us today. And it's unnatural according to Romans 1, 26 and 27. Matter of fact, the text says they will burn toward one another in their desires. I've, heard people, I've read where people have used that and turned it around and say, no, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about rape again. Here's this guy again. A proclivity towards something uh, doesn't mean we have to act on it or that we can change the, can't change the behavior. Now here's what we understand. Well, that's just a proclivity that I have and I can't change. Now we're going to talk about them just more in just a moment. But remember our text we read, had read for us at the beginning? 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now listen to verse 11. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, do you hear what he said? You were, you were sodomites and homosexuals and drunkards and liars and revilers and all those things. That's the way you were. But notice, please, with the past tense, friends, you can no longer, you couldn't be a child of God when you were that way. You had to change. Change is important. But if we listen to folks today and say, well, that's just the way I'm born. I can't change those things. I can't help. It's innate inside of me. Then we're saying that then you can't change from sin. Listen, folks. We can change a lot of things about our life. It's called repentance. We don't live in that sinful state anymore. We don't do those things anymore. We don't live in that way. We do change our behavior. Now that guy's not an expert, but I want to show you one who is. Norman Doidge, again, the brain that changes itself. Uh, Dr. Doidge, by the way, is no Christian, just so you know. And I like reading books like this because I like to see uh, the other viewpoint, but he's much like Meyer and some of those others we've looked at. He is a psychiatrist of probably 35 years. He's seen a lot of different things. He's worked with changing the brain, uh, getting things changed around. And here's something else that he says here. The brain structure that regulates instinctive behaviors, including sex, called the hypothalamus, is plastic. I'll get to that in just a moment, as is the amygdala, the structure that processes emotion and anxiety. So what he's saying is this, the plasticity of the brain, as it's often called, is just that, that we can retrain, we can teach an old dog new tricks. I'm not calling you dogs, I'm just using an illustration, but we can change the way we are. We've all done it if we become a Christian, because we've repented. 
I've changed my behavior over here, and I've changed it to something over here. What has motivated that cognitive change in me? It may be Jesus Christ, it may be God, it may be the understanding of hell, the understanding of heaven, whatever it is, but something has motivated me to say, I don't want to stay over here, I want to be over here with God. Now that is a plastic brain, and it changes because there have been people in their 90s baptized into Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins. We can change our mind, we can change who we are, we can use that plasticity, and we use it every day. Because we learn something new. We learn something new. We change our thoughts on things. We look at things different. We read research papers. We do whatever it is. And we keep working that brain. Doctors have been telling us for years, uh, especially with dementia, Alzheimer's, use the brain. It's like anything else. You don't use it, you lose it. Look, folks, I don't know about you, but I don't have much left up there. And I want to hang on to what I got. And it's good to exercise that brain every day. But the idea here is just that. Uh, just like with the amygdala. The amygdala is what the part of our brain that gives us that we have a uh, fight or flight we talk about. But there's another F in there too, and it's called freeze. It, it tells us what we want to do. Something scary, sometimes people freeze. You ever seen that? Sometimes they run, and sometimes they punch and kick and fight like the world is over with. Right? But all of these things, what he's saying is, when you're working with someone who has severe anxiety, uh, even depression, but especially anxiety, one thing you want to do is retrain that amygdala to understand that when I see something, I shouldn't be afraid of it. I mean, we do that all the time. How many of our kids have been afraid of the dark, right? What do we do? Oh, you're right. I wouldn't go in that room if I were you. It's dark. Monsters are in there. Or do we say, wait just a moment. Hold my hand. Let's go look at the dark. And they get over it. Use our plastic brains, use those plastic minds. So to say that it can't change is ridiculous. Let's look at these closing statements. Just, there's this guy again, but he's got one more closing statement. To deny our ability to change our sexual preference and behavior is now the brain's ability to change anything. That's what we've been talking about. God created our minds, our brains, and minds included in the brain, our brains to be able to change and understand. When you first went to first grade and they were sitting you down there and you looked at the ABCs and it might as well have been Russian, right? What is this? And you see, see mathematics and there's no way I'll be able to do that. No way I can do those things. And you get older and you start being introduced to algebra and geometry or you're introduced to various forms of literature and you've got to read these things and learn these things and all these things coming along there. You know what you do? Your brain is growing and changing and is plastic and moving and learning to change and accept these things around you. If, from a scientific perspective, folks, I can't change the way I am sexually, then I can't change anything. I am just that lump of cells that was still in the womb, as they like to say. I am just there doing nothing but just molecules in motion, walking around, hoping to keep going one more day, but I believe we all know different than that. We know, even from a secular position, we know different than that. That we can change our mind or attitude toward things. You know what people are told a lot of times when they're told they're going to be fired from the job uh, if they don't shape up or sh they're going to ship out? Most of the time, folks, if they want to keep working and eating, will shape up. Some folks don't care about shipping out. Most folks do. We change. Now to tell us that there's no way the, change, the brain can change. Again, this guy is not a Christian, I can assure you. I've read a couple of his books. Uh, he's not an irate, tyrannical guy because he still states the truth about things. But look at what he says about the understanding, and this is universal in the psychological, psychiatrical world. To understand about it, that's what most therapy is is learning how to rethink a situation. If I have a phobia about something, we talk about facing the fears, you do. Now, you don't throw someone in a pit of spiders because I have a fear of spiders. You work with it slowly, plastic spider and that sort of thing. Or a pit of snakes because this guy would die on the way down. But you work with that, folks. Listen, God has worked with us. God has always made things right. Now you think about here in Matthew 19, go back to our marriage scenario that Jesus talks about. 
and he, he continues on on the discussion about marriage and what it's supposed to be, clinging to our husbands and wives as one, because remember he said the two shall become one, right? One body, one soul, spirit, movement together, that sort of thing, which by the way is a reason why a lot of marriages break down. They don't understand two becoming one. And when we do that, folks, but listen, he says, and it goes through the reason you can get divorced and remarriage and some can't, but he goes in chapter, in, in the last three verses of that section, and he says, talks about eunuchs, and it seems odd, but let's look at it for just a moment. Some men are born eunuchs. Some are made eunuchs by other men, uh, folks that worked around uh, the harems and stuff often were made eunuchs. I think you understand why. And he says, some people are, make themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Now, the idea is there that if I'm not scripturally eligible to get remarried because my divorce is not scriptural, then I can live without that sexual union and bliss. I mean, that's the picture he's talking about. I don't know what else it could be. I've heard people say some outlandish things, but you've got to write a lot in your margins to figure that out. But here's my point from this is, Jesus says we can change even our sexual appetites if that's what it takes for me to get to heaven. I don't try to change Jesus. I don't try to change God. I don't try to justify it by all these mis mistaken verses and all these things, but I do justify it by doing what is right. If I am, in that, if I am a person who is gay, homosexual, lesbian, whatever the term you want to use, and I have that same-sex attraction... I can control it like anybody else does about any other urge. Just like the fornicator, the guy that wants to sleep with every woman he sees. Folks, he can change. And he's going to have to change. There's no choice around it. To do what God wants us to do. Now, folks, listen. When we look at what the Bible has to say, when we look at science, and we touch the hem of the iceberg on both of those topics today, but when you look at what the Bible and true science has to say, folks, both are in complete harmony all the way through the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. When you look at what it says, it tells us that the homosexual agenda, whatever you want to call it, all those things are as sinful just as much as anything else. And the repulsion that I've seen people, I remember watching about three years ago, four years ago now, of and I'm going to use this term very loosely, Christians, very, very loosely, by the way, if I could do quadruple marks on that one, I would, celebrating the fact that at a wedding they had a four-year-old boy up there singing a song, and the theme of the song was, Ain't No Homos Going to Heaven. And he would sing that line, and everybody would cheer and rock us and jump out of the seats. Folks, that's not something to applaud. That's something to shed tears for, because somebody's in sin. Period. Preachers have been saying for years that we need to just kill them all and let God sort them out. I thought, God's going to sort you out too. Why them rather than, what about the liars? What about the revilers? What about the railers, those people that yell and scream at everybody? You know, that's condemned in the Bible too, 1 Corinthians 5, and Peter also does in 1 Peter 2. Railers, people that yell and scream at everybody for no loser, loser temper all the time and yelling, yelling at everybody. That's just as sinful as anybody else. When's the last time you heard a sermon on railing? Well, buck up. You're going to hear one pretty soon now, it looks like. <laughs> on railing on somebody. Why? Because it's something that can cause us to lose our soul. And we can't categorize sin, folks. Uh, You've got to look somewhere besides the Bible. Because the Bible isn't going to teach it. Souls are lost, people are lost, and God wants to save. And that's the joy of it all. That's the message of it all. To look at what God did. God sent His Son that all could be saved. Those folks in Corinth, now folks, I don't know how much you know about Corinth, but it was as wicked as you get. It was a modern day Sodom and Gomorrah all rolled into one. And lewdness that went on there is unbelievable. But He said some of those folks were able to change. They came to Jesus. They understood their lost condition. They understand their depravity, not just because of what they were doing, because they never understood about Jesus. They never understood about sin. But when they came to that realization, they changed their minds around. They obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I love what he says. You are washed, you are justified, and you are sanctified. All three terms mean the same or, have, or referring to the same action. 
but it tells us something about it. Washed, it's clean. You're justified. I am righteous now before God. You ever heard Christian people say, well, I wish I was righteous. Well, if you were baptized in your sins, fellow, you are. And I was justified, and I was sanctified. That word sanctify, the root of it is the same word that means holy. God made me holy. God made you holy. No matter what we did in the past and all the sins we may have done, who cares? Because when I read Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 10, you know what it says twice? It's verbatim in each, each time. That when God forgives sins and listen to it, He remembers them no more. I wish people would remember that. They're no more. They're gone. Paul wasn't bringing it up there in 1 Corinthians 6 as a rub it in your face, but to show them that anybody can be forgiven for anything. Our minds can change, our souls can change, folks, and we can change for the better. We can put all the world behind us no matter what it is. We've talked about one sin this morning, but folks, any sin will cause us to lose our soul. Don't live in that state. Live in a state of blessings. Live in that sanctified state. Live in that justified state. And live our life for God every day. Folks, if you have need today, why don't you come while we stand and while we sing.